All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We know that some people uh, are still coming in. Welcome to your Washington Economic Club and our special event today uh, entitled Big Ideas to Redefine Emergency Healthcare. Uh, it has been our goal in the midst of the pandemic to still be relevant and still bring you information and the ability to do some networking probably be on the side. But your Washington Economic Club really endeavors to ensure that we have meaningful conversation, that we make connections with information and issues uh, that are prevalent, uh, not just in industry, but in our community. We know that COVID-19 has impacted the way that we do business, the way that we live, the way that we work. And we thought it was uh, a great opportunity to have a discussion about something that oftentimes we don't discuss in this type of forum, and that's healthcare. Uh, we have a, an amazing panel, which I'll introduce in a minute, uh, of, of practitioners and leaders in the field. But I wanna thank um, our board of trustees, uh, some of them who are with us today, I know that uh, our chair of our board, Bill Milliken, Trustee Milliken, thank you for your continued support. Uh, but we have a number of, of, of trustees that continue to support the vision, and, and we're grateful to that. Um, there are some platinum members that make, even in a virtual environment, the economic club what it is. They financially support uh, both the economic club and the college. So we want to thank Ann Arbor Spark, as well as Washington County. Um, government. Uh, and of course, the college serves as a platinum sponsor uh, by their investment and hosting uh, of the club. There's some um, time today that uh, we are going to allot for questions and answers. Uh, of course, within your chat, you'll be able to submit those questions. Uh, and when our, our, our presenters are, are done, we'll be able to answer those. But then um, you know, throughout the, the, the session today, if you have things that come to mind, you do not have to wait until the end. You can do so by putting them right in the chat. I do want to honor also not just our platinum uh, members, but our gold members today, some of which I know are with us, uh, ITC uh, and Highlight. And then, of course, you, uh, who is who um, are silver members uh, level one bank at Bank of Ann Arbor. But then we also have our members who make up the club. Um, and we're grateful for you for investing your time and your money to make sure that the WEC is uh, what it has become to be today. As I mentioned, we have an um, amazing lineup uh, of speakers today. Uh, Dr. Robert Newbar and Dr. Kevin Ward, both uh, who are affiliated uh, with our community engine uh, called the University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, Dr. Newbar serves as professor, professor and chair of emergency medicine. And Dr. Kevin Ward serves as a professor of emergency medicine. Uh, we do have a bio, and I just want to highlight uh, who is with you today. Dr. Uh, Newbar, uh, as I said, serves as professor and chair of emergency medicine at U of M. Uh, he is board certified uh, about both by the American Board of Emergency Medicine and as a fellow of the American College of Emergency Medicine. Uh, he arrived in Ann Arbor in 2012, uh, previously uh, was at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we're grateful, Dr. Newbar, you made that transition to a great community like Ann Arbor. Uh, but he has done work on the local, uh, the state, and the national level, uh, and has been a recognized leader internationally in the field of cardiac arrest research. Uh, due to that national international status, uh, he has a number of funded grants and research, uh, specifically by NIH, which we know is coveted, the National Institute of Health, around laboratory and clinical investigation of extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, 
I practiced that last night at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, as a rescue therapy in refractory cardiac arrest. Uh, Dr. Newmar, if I jack that up, uh, tell me about it later. That's, you did great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we also have Dr. Ward, uh, who uh, is also from uh, the University of Michigan, serves as a full professor of emergency medicine, um, and has, as Dr. Newbar, uh, a local, state, and national impact in terms of research. He is uh, a veteran um, serving uh, as a lieutenant colonel uh, in the U.S. Army Reserves Medical Corps, and actually was deployed to Afghanistan. So when you think about international medicine and research, as well as the application of that, who better than Dr. Numar and Dr. Ward to be with us today? So we are definitely so grateful for their willingness to uh, join us. And at this time, I'm going to allow Dr. Numar and Dr. Ward to take over. So the floor is yours. All right. Well, great. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And um, just thank you for the opportunity to come and, and speak to this really important group. Uh, you know, one of the things we don't do well in academic medicine is engage community leaders uh, in really uh, partnerships that we could do, be, you know, we could do more and be more productive uh, in the common goals that we have, which is really improving uh, health and quality of life in our community. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to come here is sort of to, one, provide a little bit of background uh, about what emergency medicine is all about. A lot of people outside uh, healthcare uh, have different ideas of what emergency, the history of emergency medicine as a specialty and what it is contributing to the community, but also wanted to highlight, and I'm gonna rely on Dr. Ward for doing that, highlighting some of the scientific and technology innovations that we have been uh, pursuing here at the University of Michigan uh, to improve the quality of healthcare, uh, and in particular, uh, highlighting some of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, with that, uh, just uh, sort of just an overview primer uh, of emergency medicine. When you, when you think about emergency departments, which is where we practice emergency medicine, it really is a crossroad in, in American medicine. And when I say that, it re really is the interface between outpatient medical care and inpatient medical care. Uh, and when you think about you know, hospitalizations, more than half of the hospitalizations or when people get admitted to the hospital uh, come through the emergency department. So we really are at that interface of those two uh, domains of medical care. Uh, and in addition to that, we sort of help oversee and coordinate uh, ambulance-based or pre-hospital care, which is really an important safety net for the community uh, all the way from you know, issues related to uh, mass casualty incidents, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest, arrest which Brandon mentioned, uh, and in more recently man, you know, addressing the COVID uh, pandemic. And you know, you know, 60 or 70 years ago, uh, all this wasn't in place. Uh, there weren't emergency departments staffed by people specifically trained to deliver emergency care. There weren't ambulance systems to uh, pick up people from car accidents and bring them to the hospital. And this really has all evolved over the past 60 uh, or, or so years. Uh, and, and, you know, we would be in a very different place in our communities without that uh, system of care for emergency medicine. And, you know, our really goal is to focus on a lot of the time sensitive medical care that uh, requires very rapid diagnosis and rapid treatment to be effective. And we think about things like cardiac arrest and stroke and heart attacks, um, those are the things that really, in order to have good outcomes, require a very uh, uh, streamlined system of rapid diagnosis and treatment that occurs in the EMS system in emergency departments. This advance. So I wanna talk a little bit about the origins of emergency medicine, uh, because like I said, you know, more than you know, 50, 60 years ago, we really didn't have any of this. And, and, so sort of what's credited for the sort of the original emergency department was the Alexandria project in Alexandria, Virginia in 1961. And the situation at that time was Alexandria Hospital uh, was had an emergency room basically that was being uh, 
dramatic increase in the number of patients showing up needing emergency care. Uh, and you know, when we look at these numbers now, they're not huge, but there was, they were up to about 18,000 people showing up for emergency care at one time, and they really didn't have any system uh, to deliver that care. And they had basically in the basement of the hospital, a room with four stretchers, and that's where the people that needed emergency care uh, showed up. And there was a group of physicians led by James Mills and three other physicians that decided that they were going to dedicate their medical practice to providing emergency care. Before that time, there were not physicians that specialized in emergency care. People only did it part-time or happened to be on call in the hospital. And these four physicians decided to make this their full-time practice in a model where they staffed the emergency department 24-7 doing uh, five 12-hour shifts in a row. Um, and the, interestingly, on the economic side, at that time, the charge per visit was $5, and we're sort of probably two orders of magnitude above that uh, now. And But in, similar to now, uh, they're also providing care for people that couldn't afford it, and that was subsidized by the hospital. And we continue uh, to provide care uh, for anyone that uh, needs it and shows up at our doors uh, in, in emergency medicine, and that's a, an important uh, community safety net. So, you know, thinking about this, right, we're, that's, you know, 60 years ago, this was just the beginning. I'm just going to show you some data now the, of the extent of what emergency care uh, is in the United States. So this is, a, you know, the most recently available national data up to 2017, where you see that the number of emergency department visits in the country is over 140 million visits, 140 million. So that's almost, you know, for a population of, uh, of the country is about 380 million. Almost every other person in the country will visit an emergency department once a year. And that's responsible about 20 million uh, hospital admissions. So uh, it really has expanded into a major critical component of the healthcare system. And right now we have about 38,000 board certified emergency physicians. So these are physicians that dedicate their full-time medical practice to providing care in the emergency department setting. And there's about 5,000 emergency departments across the country. So it's become a major component of our healthcare system across the United States. So what are we doing at uh, Michigan Medicine? So again, we always strive to be uh, the leaders and best, and we aspire to be uh, one of the leading departments of emergency medicine in the country and provide the best quality emergency care for our community. Uh, we have, uh, this is, uh, you know, aerial view of the Michigan Medicine campus. Um, sorry, we have our main adult emergency department here. So we provide adult emergency care and then pediatric emergency care up at Mott Children's Hospital. Uh, we also have our survival flight program, which is aeromedical transport. We oversee, uh, our, our faculty oversee uh, the Washtenaw Livingston County Medical Control Authority, which coordinates pre-hospital care with Huron Valley Ambulance and Livingston County Ambulance. Uh, and we provide uh, input in terms of optimizing the quality of care in the pre-hospital setting including, as we mentioned before, uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and just to show you some of our data, the adult emergency department at University Hospital sees 75,000 annual visits. Uh, the pediatric emergency department, and these are numbers pre-COVID pandemic, 34,000 annual visits. So about 100,000 visits, you know, that's about 200 visits a day in the adult emergency department, about 100 visits a day in the pediatric emergency department. And this is serving the local community uh, in the Ann Arbor region, but we have also uh, patients that seek emergency care in our EDs that travel two, three, uh, even four hours uh, for care on their own and either or are often transported from outside emergency departments across the state uh, to provide a higher level of care that we can uh, at the University of Michigan. In addition, uh, survival flight is really a key component of our system of care, both uh, with our helicopters and fixed wing uh, jets that we can transport uh, critically ill patients from outside emergency departments across the state and even uh, into uh, Ohio uh, for, for emergency care, uh, as well as uh, the, the fixed wing is helping uh, organ uh, procurement for uh, transplant as well. And in the past year we had, um, or most recent years, about 1,200 1, annual transports a year. So significant uh, contribution there. Uh, as well. One of the things where we felt was an important area where innovation uh, was required is this interface of emergency medicine and critical care. So critical care 
is when someone's critically ill, they have a life-threatening illness, they're likely to require some time in a, an intensive care unit. And more and more over the past decades, uh, the, the patients that have, you know, showing up in the emergency department or being brought to the emergency department have critical care needs. And there's been an ongoing challenge of, uh, in many hospitals that the ICUs are full, there's not enough ICU capacity uh, to bring in all the patients that might need ICU care. And uh, the complexity of that care uh, is getting uh, you know, more and more extensive where we have better interventions that uh, are time sensitive requiring rapid diagnosis and treatment to deliver them. And that includes things like cardiac arrest, sepsis, heart attacks, strokes, traumatic brain injury, uh, for example. So, so what we felt was an important innovation that was gonna be required is really to figure out a way to uh, bring that higher level of critical care into the emergency department. And we sort of define that as emergency critical care. And uh, one of the strategies that we developed when I came here as department chair is thinking about bringing the ICU to the emergency department. So rather than a patient coming to the emergency department needing ICU level care, waiting for that when there's a bed open, we decided we would build an ICU in our emergency department at the university hospital. And this is one of the initial diagrams of that where we have uh, in the bottom right here, the ambulance entrance, we have what we call our resuscitation bays where piece, people are initially treated uh, and their care optimized. And then we have a nine bed unit uh, right beside the, that initial area where we can provide critical uh, ICU level care in the emergency department setting. Uh, this was sort of the ribbon cutting of that uh, unit uh, uh, with uh, our, our main uh, philanthropic sponsor, Brenda Massey. Uh, in the middle, the dean of the medical school at that time, Jim uh, Willis-Croth, Tony Denton, who was the uh, chief operating officer, myself, and our uh, division chief for critical care, Kyle Gunnarsson. Uh, and this was launched as the Joyce and Don Massey Family Foundation uh, Critical Care Unit. Uh, this is some pictures of inside the unit. You know, basically, this is uh, we we hired and brought in people that were dual boarded in emergency medicine and critical care to help lead and run this. We put our nurses who were emergency department nurses and take, sent them up to the different ICUs to get ICU level training. So now it's a new subspecialty of a nursing where you're an emergency ICU a nurse. We created protocols in the emergency department that deliver the same level of care as an inpatient ICU. And this all, and we provided training uh, programs for emergency medicine physicians to train in fellowships in critical care and become board certified in critical care. And this has, uh, you know, we've published research on this uh, model showing that we have significant improvement in patient outcomes, including uh, improvement in survival rate of the overall population uh, presenting to the emergency department. And we published that uh, in JAMA recently. So all that's good. And then, uh, as you all know, uh, from the business end of things, uh, we've recently sort of been punched in the face with the uh, challenges of the COVID pandemic and how uh, we needed to respond to that. And really, you know, the challenge on the emergency medicine side was we were really on the front line. Uh, the patients that were, uh, that were acquiring COVID and that were needing medical care uh, came through the front door of the emergency department, and we had to adapt very rapidly and innovate to respond to that. Uh, these are the numbers for Washtenaw County. Uh, you've, if you have probably looked at this from our county website, showing the initial, initial peak in the individual. So these are COVID positive tests per day. Initial peak uh, back in uh, March of 20, uh, where we were sort of up, you know, at, we never really got above hundred cases. We had the lull and then the secondary peak uh, that happened over the winter where we were up to almost 300 cases a day. Uh, things calmed down uh, in January, February. And then we had the spring peak that occurred uh, in, you know, peaked out in March and April with, again, over 200 cases a day. And unfortunately, we're beginning to see here in August another rise uh, coming up that we're keeping a close eye on, and it's raising concerns for an, an additional peak that we're preparing for. This is data from our dashboard in the emergency department at the adult uh, emergency department at the university hospital, showing a similar pattern of patients testing positive in our emergency department. So we peaked in the April of 20, about 27 patients. We were seeing about 29 or 30 patients up to day last December. And in, the, in March, again, about 30 patients a day were showing up in the emergency department testing positive for COVID. And we're starting to see a little bit of a ramp up with a high number a couple of days ago of 12. So 
we're on top of this. We're adapting and developing strategies to optimize the evaluation and treatment of these patients, but we're definitely on the front line. So what is the COVID pandemic uh, required in terms of a, a response? So, you know, as you probably you know, know from the news, we had a rapidly evolving understanding of the way that the disease symptoms themselves, uh, the how it was transmitted and how it's treated. And we basically, uh, you know, had um, sometimes um, daily and then down to sort of several times a week, uh, department town halls talking about our response and our rapidly evolving strategies to optimize the care of patients uh, that are uh, presenting with COVID. Uh, and we had, we've made significant improvements in our processes and our protocols uh, to protect uh, the patients, protect their families while they're in the emergency department and uh, protect healthcare providers. One of the things we saw was actually, even though there were more patients uh, with uh, COVID presenting to the emergency department, a dramatic decrease in the overall number of patients that actually came to the emergency department. And, and the concern there was people that were needing medical care weren't, were avoiding medical care because of the concern of uh, getting uh, COVID when they showed up at a healthcare center. And that's something that we continue to work on to provide the best safety for not only the patients and providers, but the family members as well uh, in the emergency department setting. Uh, and then rapid scientific advancement to develop and study new treatments. Do, uh, Dr. Ward's gonna talk about some of those advancements. Uh, we, were, uh, we were participated in many clinical trials evaluating uh, COVID therapy. Our pathology department at the University of Michigan was at the lead in developing rapid tests. When we first uh, started dealing with the pandemic in March, uh, we had to send out COVID tests to the state depart medical department for a result and it would take two to three days to come back. So uh, it was really difficult to manage a patient that you have to wait two or three days to know whether they really uh, had a COVID infection or not. Now we're at the point where we have a test result in 30 minutes. So if someone comes, they get tested with their nose swab, we get the result uh, and a very highly accurate result based on uh, PCR testing within 30 minutes. So sometimes before the physician even gets to see the patient, uh, their COVID test is back and that's dramatically optimized our care. We've also uh, did research in different therapies, including uh, a research uh, project that was led by one of our faculty, uh, Fred Corley, looking at uh, convalescent plasma as one of the treatment strategies. And then the other uh, impact on the community was this shifting of resources to deal with the pandemic. Both you know, University of Michigan did and many other hospitals did in terms of shut down their ambulatory care or really consolidate it, cancel a lot of elective surgery, delay uh, standard medical care, which negatively impacted the, the health of the community. Uh, and, and people then also were reluctant to seek medical care because of the concern of uh, contracting COVID while they were interacting with the healthcare system. And we continue to need to deal with that balance and, uh, and try to avoid negative impacts on the rest of the healthcare system as we deal with the COVID pandemic itself. And I think that's, that's where we come to this idea of adjusting to the new norm. Uh, we really can't survive with another shutdown of uh, all elective or semi-elective surgery because uh, of the detrimental effect that has on the, the general population and the overall health of our community. Uh, we must develop ways to normalize our operations in the presence of uh, the pandemic and the presence of high incidence of COVID and continue to be able to provide all the other essential health care uh, that we need to provide. And, you know, things like telemedicine are, are valuable solutions, but we still need to have solutions that we can interact with patients and provide the best care in a face-to-face -face, uh, manner. And that's where I think the University of Michigan really has a strong infrastructure to help address these challenges that are affecting our community. Um, you know, this is, a case, this is a story that was put in the, um, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal about uh, the, the, the financial impact of COVID on the healthcare system with patients having very complex cases of COVID, spending weeks and months in the hospital with extremely high uh, medical bills as well. So I think at the University of Michigan, we are greatly in a great position to address the issues related to the COVID pandemic itself, but also all the challenges faced in optimizing emergency care. Uh, these are just some of the data of our research infrastructure. And then I'll just finish with some of the, you know, our, our Department of Emergency Medicine is a leader amongst the country in, in research and innovation. We're currently ranked number one in NIH funding with 
uh, over $20 million last year. And when you look at market share for emergency medicine, that's about a quarter of the market share of NIH funding across the country. So we're uh, having a major impact in uh, the research uh, that's needed to optimize emergency care. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Dr. Ward to talk about MSERC is our Michigan Center for Integrative Research in Critical Care and some of the innovations that have, uh, have been the product of that research enterprise. Thanks, Dr. Numar. Uh... Hello, everyone. Actually, before we do that, maybe I, I was, I was, let me pause and see if anyone have any questions uh, before we move into that related to, uh, you know, the system of care for emergency medicine or what we're doing at Michigan Medicine overall in emergency care. Well, one quick question, Dr. Newmar, uh, pre-COVID, is there any data that explains some of those leading causes for patients um, receiving emergency care treatment from a local perspective? Um, in terms of what do you mean by leading cause, what, what are the most common sort of presentations or? The most common reasons uh, for patients to, to receive emergency care treatment. Yeah, so it's interesting because one of the things that uh, emergency medicine is really important for is diagnosis based on symptoms. So when we look at sort of the numbers of you know, the data about emergency care, um, you know, we have some data about specific disease processes that, that come in, but we actually look more at sort of symptoms, right? So when someone comes to the emergency department, they usually don't know what's wrong with them, right? And that's why they're coming to seek emergency care. And so our most common symptom presentations are chest pain, uh, you know, people concerned about a heart attack and things like that, but they come in with chest pain or abdominal pain. And, and those are sort of the main uh, reasons people seek emergency care. We certainly get a lot of cases related to trauma. Uh, that could be from, you know, car accidents and falls and things like that. Uh, and, you know, people with uh, infectious disease or illness with fevers. But, uh, you know, so those are the th main things that sort of come in. And then when you look at the numbers, um, you know, the, the most important uh, disease processes where we have the greatest impact on are things like stroke, uh, heart attack or myocardial infarction, uh, you know, cardiac arrest, uh, se severe infections that lead to sepsis, where the infection spreads beyond just the area locally infected, and that can be life-threatening. So those are the areas where I think we have the biggest impact uh, on patient care. As a follow-up, is there any demographic data connected to those presentations that, that reveal any patterns or trends amongst a specific group of people or age range um, that come in, to come in for emergency treatment? Yeah, I guess probably the biggest is the, the demographic sort of driver is age. Um, so we, first of all, we divide adult and pediatric emergency departments. We see patients separately there. Um, but I would say the biggest driver of change, you know, moving forward is the aging population. And as the population ages, um, they, have, they have more complicated uh, medical care. They often have more chronic diseases that can decompensate and result in more uh, frequent emergency department visits. So part of the driving force that many people believe the increase in emergency department visits is the, the shifting of the, the average age of the population uh, has been a, a major driving force for that. Thank you, Dr. Numar. Uh, those are all the questions that we have at this time. All right, now we can hand it off to Dr. Ward. Thanks, Dr. Numar. Uh, thank you everybody for letting me join. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a little background about critical care and emergency medicine and, and the genesis of uh, sort of our new approach was sort of to transform the landscape of emergency and critical care through innovation and entrepreneurship. So this is really timely uh, to talk to uh, your council here about some of these things. So you know, if I ask people what cancer is, everyone has a good idea about what cancer is. They know someone who's had cancer, maybe they're a cancer survivor, they've seen a St. Jude's commercial. When you talk about emergency and critical care, people have a little less of an idea. On this slide to your left here, you see sort of major groupings of critical care. Uh, so neurologic emergencies like stroke and traumatic brain injury, inflammation and organ failure like uh, pneumonia and bloodstream infections like sepsis, critical heart conditions like um, heart attack or uh, heart failure. 
Um, and you could, you could substitute these things for cancer. You could say, if you're talking about cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, say, I'm not sure if something happened to my. Well, that, that's my fault. I'm, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the cancer folks have sort of figured it out because they realize that there are lots of commonalities uh, amongst cancers. So this is why you can make a discovery in prostate cancer and create a blockbuster therapy in breast cancer. Uh, we're just now sort of figuring that out in emergency and critical care, where you have all these sort of diverse uh, presentations on the left, but they really share a lot in common from a biology perspective. Uh, now, an another way we sort of really differ for cancer is that when you get cancer, the same team sort of takes care of you from your diagnosis to remission. In emergency and critical care, there's this, these echelons or levels of care where you may have different teams taking care of you. You may have a pre-hospital care team of the EMTs and paramedics taking care of you at the site of your accident. Then you come to the emergency department where you have a team there, and then you get transferred to the operating room. There's another team, then to the ICU, which is another team, and then rehabilitation. So we have lots of, of challenges from a technology and care perspective that some specialties like cancer uh, don't face. Next slide. So uh, part of our opportunity here is to sort of realize those commonalities and create platform technologies and approaches that span the spectrum of critical care. So um, we're at MSERC and the University of Michigan, we're developing technologies, for example, that may have been designed to take care of a wounded warrior out in the field that we're also testing in critically ill neonates that you see uh, at your right. So that's a, a 500 gram premature neonate. And we actually have monitors that we've developed for the Department of Defense for casualty care that we're testing in the neonatal ICU. And the reason that is, is because those two extremes actually share a lot of common physiology uh, and biology. So these platform technologies will really have um, uh, a, a, an impact uh, across the spectrum. So Dr. Newmar talked about moving uh, the critical care unit or the ICU to the emergency department. This is an opportunity to actually move the ICU into the field or perhaps even to someone's home. Next slide. So uh, we launched uh, uh, several years ago, and uh, MSERC is really tapping into the intellectual capital and capacity around the University of Michigan. So uh, Dr. Newmar and I can attest that we've been practicing for about 30 years, but I can honestly say we don't have any game-changing technologies that exist now that we didn't have 30 years ago. In other words, my ability to save your life within minutes to hours is not that greater than it was 30 years ago. And again, the reason that is, is probably we have not gotten outside the walls of medicine to develop solutions. So MSERC was designed to be the hub at the University of Michigan to bring together all the great minds. Many of them exist outside the medical school. They exist in uh, the College of Engineering, the College of Pharmacy, uh, sometimes the College of the, the School of Business. So we currently have about 200 members across 43 departments at the University of Michigan representing seven of its schools and colleges. Next slide. So these are some of our metrics. So when you talk about uh, centers and their performance, uh, a lot of times you hear about the number of papers published or how much grant money. We still do all those things. But uh, some of the metrics that make us stand out are the number of new discoveries, for example, that result in invention disclosures and patents, how many spinoff companies. So all the, the, that talent we talked about from the College of Engineering and the uh, medical school, uh, we're also trying to tap in into the entrepreneurial uh, community that exists in the surrounding area. Uh, the state uh, level and even the national level to take those ideas to final impact. Next slide. So I'm gonna. This is a this is a cartoon that sort of lets you understand sort of our approach. And I will maintain that we are really unique in academic medicine. So this is kind of just a fun summary of those things I just talked about. This is Ben. 
He's a doctor, and he has a great idea for a tool that will help him treat critically ill and injured patients. But he doesn't have the expertise to build this tool. This is Maria. She's a biomedical engineer and an expert in computation and modeling. She could build the tool, but she doesn't know what clinical outputs healthcare providers are looking for. And this is Paul. While he's not a doctor or a researcher, he does have the financial means and desire to help make a difference in critical care. But as a potential donor, he wants to ensure that his money will be put to good use. So how can innovative doctors like Ben meet engineers like Maria and donors like Paul? We are the Michigan Center for Integrative Research and Critical Care, or MSERC. We connect researchers from different disciplines and help them get their innovative research from the bench to the bedside. But that's only part of it. We've connected Ben and Maria, yet having a great idea isn't enough. They're going to need access to the right tools and resources before their idea can become a reality. That's the MSERC difference. As MSERC members, Ben and Maria have access to funding through our Grand Challenge Competition, which funds high-risk, high-reward proposals thanks to donors like Paul. They are also able to work one-on-one -on -one with our Proposal Development Unit to help them win additional grants to get their research over the finish line. They can conduct their research in our specialized labs and have access to our big data analytic platform. And they can work with our data scientists who are experts in machine learning and predictive medicine. To keep them on track, they'll work with our commercialization coaches who will help them navigate the world of patents, FDA regulations, and ensure they're meeting their milestones. We'll even introduce them to industry partners to help accelerate their research. So whether you're a researcher, business partner, or donor, we're ready to connect you with people just like Ben and Maria. And together, we can change the way critical care is delivered to save patient lives. All right, next slide. So this is a, a platform. It's extraordinarily unique in the world of academic medicine, and it's really helping us shortcut or circumvent the traditional uh, circuit so that we can de-risk ideas and get them to market uh, very quickly. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, and explain sort of how this platform has helped accelerate of products uh, into the commercial uh, sector. So um, again, all of this is meant to lower the energy barrier to create team science that ordinarily wouldn't exist because it can be very, very hard for an engineer to work with a physician. We talk two different languages, we're in two different schools. Um, and uh, so again, th these, these, this platform really helps uh, to get across those barriers. So Dr. Newmar talked about uh, the COVID um, uh, issue. You know, COVID's very contagious, and one of the, the, the population really at risk are healthcare providers uh, uh, to get the virus. So we have, to, we have to provide lots of therapies to patients, which actually aerosolize that virus and put it in the air and make it easier for other patients or for healthcare providers to get. So uh, we developed some uh, PPE or personal protective equipment for patients. So we actually developed this, uh, submitted patents, spun off a company and recently got FDA approval for one of these products. And these are two negative pressure systems which we can take and put on a patient to isolate them immediately. And what this does is it pulls air up through that helmet or through the tent and that air leaves that space and gets filtered so that when it leaves, it's purified, there's no virus in it. So this is a way to really contain and, and isolate a highly infectious patient and actually to employ some very risky procedures to help keep patients off ventilators, keep them alive, uh, but at the same time, keep uh, healthcare providers safe. Go ahead, next slide. So I'm gonna show you a video of this, uh, we'll start. I'll just kind of walk you through it. So again, we could have a patient come in and uh, be really, really sick, coughing, and need a therapy, and that virus is just getting everywhere. So this is uh, the tent we developed that just got approval. And in that tent, we, we put slits in the tent to allow healthcare providers to get their arms and help attach 
monitors to patients and do certain procedures. Now think that's the virus, that white mist. So if a patient's coughing or we're giving that patient a nebulizer, that's what's happening to the virus. It's getting out and leaking to the uh, atmosphere and potentially contaminating and infecting healthcare workers. But when we put the tent on and we activate this exhaust fan, what it's doing is it's pulling all of that uh, aerosolized virus particles out. No, so with the, with the fan on, nothing can escape uh, the tent and we continue providing life-saving uh, procedures and therapies to that patient without risking uh, the health of the healthcare providers. All right, next slide. Uh, this is a project we uh, developed and got funded by the Department of Defense and the National Institutes of Health. It's a breathalyzer, basically, that allows us to detect COVID, uh, not only to detect COVID, but to detect how bad your lungs might be injured. So one of the major complications you've seen uh, for patients who develop COVID is their lungs get injured, and a lot of times we have to put them on a mechanical breathing machine and put them in the ICU. This device actually analyzes hundreds of exhaled inflammatory markers that your uh, lungs produce when they're infected. And we've come up with a signature that tells us, yes, this patient has COVID, and yes, this patient is likely to get worse or better. And this helps us triage uh, patients to determine which patients can go home, which patients can uh, or need to go to the ICU. Next slide. Uh, you know, one of the problems we face in emergency medicine is we've got patients on lots of monitors. So this is a kind of a typical patient up in the intensive care unit. And you guys have all heard the term big data and data science. Uh, there's no bigger big data problem uh, than exists in critical care. So there are about 100,000 data points coming from uh, a, this patient per second. Uh, and so we can only uh, track a couple of things at one time. And so one of the opportunities uh, in emergency medicine critical care is to develop better artificial intelligence and data science methods to take care of these patients. Next slide. So this is a great, great economic uh, success story. We actually developed a novel uh, data science analytic that just takes, uh, lets us take a look at a real-time electrocardiogram. So this is the beat to beat uh, ECG or electrocardiogram heart pattern coming from a monitor. And we're able to find really, really subtle things in that pattern that you can't detect with the human eye, but you could detect using uh, artificial intelligence that let us know if that patient is going to decompensate or get unstable hours, sometimes days before this happens. And so uh, we got a patent on this, but we actually launched a spinoff uh, in Ann Arbor. It's called Fifth Eye, and Fifth Eye was able to obtain a $10 million Series A from a uh, local venture uh, fund, Arboretum Ventures. And uh, they were just FDA approved for a product that will start to begin and go to the market. But this was a great example of engineers, physicians, and entrepreneurs coming together to solve a huge problem. And this is one of these uh, products that will be as useful in the ICU, but, but equally useful at home as people start to become monitored at home. Next slide. Uh, this is a uh, electronic medical record uh, version of this where we're taking the hundreds of data inputs from our electronic medical record. So this is, uh, includes laboratories, images, uh, signals from the monitors. And again, we're, provide, we're, we're using this technique called machine learning and artificial intelligence to make sense of these hundreds of variables to give us direction. So Dr. Newmar and I can sometimes be taking care of 20 patients at one time, and all of a sudden one will become much, much sicker and, and really surprise us. And uh, again, it's just one of these things that the human mind can't track so many variables at one time. So uh, this is a set of technologies that's actually gonna go uh, to a new startup in the near future. Next slide. 
Um, you know, sometimes you have to create actually new signals. So uh, our traditional vital signs of blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, and respiratory rate are really hard to use to figure out who is the sickest. And a lot of this has to do with the fact of the, the epidemic of chronic diseases like high blood pressure and all the medicines that, that people take for these things, including Tylenol or Advil for a fever. So uh, one of the things we're really uh, doing well and collaborating with folks around the university, including engineers, are actually to develop new monitors that actually detect signals from organ systems and biological processes that weren't there before. So on your left, there's this uh, goggles uh, here that were developed, they fit on your eyes and they send an electrical signal through your eyes into your brain. And uh, we can tell if your brain is actually getting enough blood flow uh, when, after it's been injured, for example, if you have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, that technology on the right is a ring that harnesses the information from the arteries in your finger that are contracting, expanding, and, and, and contracting with each heartbeat to give us information about how well your heart is working and how much blood flow is, uh, is going through your body. And these are things that ordinarily I would never, I'd have to drill a hole in your head to get information uh, that those goggles can provide. I'd have to put a catheter in your heart to provide the information that that ring can provide. And so these are uh, prototypes are being tested in humans. And we actually spun off a company called New Vital Signs in the Ann Arbor uh, area. Uh, to actually take these to market. Next slide. Uh, you know, the blood is your biggest organ in your body, and yet we don't have any way to tell if your blood is healthy. So this is an approach that lets us take a couple of drops of blood and tells us if your blood is too thick or too thin, uh, is it clotting properly, and are your red cells healthy enough? So this could have dramatic impact, uh, for example, on do you need a blood transfusion? How health, should you be donating blood? Uh, are you a candidate for this medicine or that medicine? So this is a great collaboration between a chemical engineer, uh, a physiologist, and various clinicians from uh, various medical disciplines, emergency medicine, uh, anesthesia, and some other critical care specialties. Next slide. Uh, this is a uh, point of care uh, test. So again, a couple of drops of blood that are able to examine hundreds of markers that your organs can produce when they're injured. Right now, it's very difficult to make these measurements. They can take days to come back, uh, but we need to make them very quickly. And again, you've all heard the term precision medicine. So this is about putting getting this information, putting together smartly, making these measures accurately at the bedside and using artificial intelligence to say, okay, you have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, what it, what's going to be your prognosis? Are you a candidate for medicine X, Y, or Z? Uh, what additional treatments do you need? And again, it's one of these platform technologies that will be tested in adults with traumatic brain injury, patients with cardiac arrest, and even sick neonates uh, who are born prematurely. Next slide. Uh, this is a great technology that uh, looks to see how well your body is getting oxygen. Is it happy with the amount of oxygen it's getting? And that's the, the, the technology we've developed on the left. It's a little clip that just hooks onto your cheek and, and monitors the inside of your cheek and in uh, 10 seconds gives us a value. Previously, what I would need to do to get that same information is I'd have to put a catheter, and if you looked at that diagram on the right, I'd have to put about a three-foot catheter into your neck and put it through your heart, through a couple of the chambers of your heart, your right atrium, your right ventricle, into your pulmonary artery, and take a blood sample there to get that same information. So that's a two hour procedure. It usually can only be done in the ICU and it costs thousands of dollars to do. And so now I can get that same information with this clip and it can be obtained by a nurse or a paramedic or an EMT or just any assistant. And I can get that same information in the emergency department, in the clinic 
and even at home if necessary. Next slide. Uh, so those are kind of real fancy things, but even simple things when you think about the tourniquet, we don't really have a great tourniquet that can be used uh, by civilians. And um, there are lots of programs out to teach civilians how to use tourniquets. Uh, the current ones that are available are extremely painful and complex to use. So we've developed a couple of novel uh, products uh, to help cyst, uh, uh, civilians uh, treat uh, hemorrhage. This tourniquet you see up in your right hand corner um, can be applied by someone who's 70 years old that can use one hand and stop blood flow in uh, uh, a 250 pound individual. Uh, it's built on special mechanics and uh, special form factors. And this is actually uh, going into a new company. It's veteran owned and operated and it'll be sold uh, in the late fall of this year. Then we have something a little more complicated. You see that, that uh, catheter on your, uh, the bottom left here. Uh, this catheter is meant to go through your mouth into your stomach and a balloon blows up. And uh, you can see on the right, there's a little plate uh, that we put on the abdomen of a patient. And that balloon can compress the aorta, which is the major vessel that carries blood flow from your heart to the rest of your body. So. If you're in a bad accident or God forbid you were shot in the abdomen and you were bleeding into your abdomen, I can't apply a tourniquet to your abdomen, but with this device, I can stop blood flow long enough to get you to uh, an emergency department and into the operating room. So uh, this is something we're designing to allow paramedics and combat medics to use out in the field to help extend the time uh, that you can survive until you actually get to definitive care. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of a, a great example of a, a collaboration with chemical engineers, emergency physicians, respiratory therapists. Uh, this is something you might see uh, soon near an automatic uh, external defibrillator, you know, that you see around in public to defibrillate uh, victims of cardiac arrest. This is a, a little box. It's got some chemicals and water in it. You turn the knob and it produces 20 minutes of pure oxygen. Uh, the goal here is to provide oxygen to people who need it uh, for about 20 minutes uh, until you can dial 911 and the paramedics can get there. So there's, it's not pressurized. There's no tank involved. There's no, it's not going to be an explosion or anything like that that might risk uh, a, a, a civilian using this. Next slide. Uh, this is another great collaboration with engineers and clinicians who are infectious disease uh, experts. This is a special bandage that has a naturally produced product in it. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but some of it's found in toothpaste, uh, in some types of toothpaste, and it kills uh, lots of evil bacteria, E. coli, Pseudomonas, MRSA, and even the SARS virus. So the great thing about this compound is that it can go into bandages, but it could also be sprayed on keyboards and other surfaces to keep those surfaces clean of bacteria. And the good thing about it is that that surface cleaning can last for months and months. Next. Uh, these are some real kind of future products. So we're even doing things like redesigning uh, the critical care bed of the future. So currently beds we use in the emergency department or intensive care units don't do very much. They kind of go up and they go down. And uh, you know, one of our challenges is if you have to go to the intensive care unit and you have to spend several weeks in the unit in a bed, uh, we have to teach those people, even young people, how to walk again. So your body, just while we're trying to keep your body alive, your muscles and nerves sort of deteriorate. And this is a real problem. So we're trying to create uh, beds or bed platforms that can actually participate in your care. So these are some diagrams of the bed of the future. They sort of resemble these massage chairs that you see, but we have lots of data showing that we can do special things with these designs, like provide special uh, 
sources of vibration uh, that actually are, are equivalent to a physical therapist helping you walk. So the idea here is that the moment you get into the bed as we're starting to treat you for your infection or your heart attack or your brain injury, the bed is actually helping to do rehab and some other things. Next slide. I think the last thing we're gonna show you is uh, not only we're interested in patients, we're also interested in their family. So as you can imagine, a stay in the emergency department or the intensive care unit can really take a toll on the entire family. In fact, studies have shown that families can develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So we need families to be really um, in a good state of mind to help uh, their family members who are in the ICU uh, make it home and do well. And so this is a uh, piece of, of um, sort of artificial intelligence and augmented reality that we work with a local company here in the Ann Arbor area to create a tool that would help family members whose loved ones are suddenly uh, in the ICU. Next slide. We'll go ahead and play this for you just to, sh to show you. Having a loved one in the hospital can be scary and confusing. ICU Chaperone is an educational augmented reality tool that allows you to learn about hospital equipment in an interactive 3D environment. This app hopes to provide comfort and education to you before you first walk into your loved one's ICU room. When you first launch the app, you'll be walked through a tutorial sequence to get you started in augmented reality or AR. AR allows you to see 3D objects through your phone camera as though they were in your environment. This will allow you to explore the ICU equipment at your own pace. To learn about a piece of equipment, center a hotspot on your phone screen and tap the blue interact button. The information panel will pop up. The summary tab gives you a brief overview of the equipment. The details tab covers a variety of subjects, including information on medical conditions and safety tips. The explore tab will allow us to take a deeper dive into how this machine works. Lastly, the staff tab will teach you about the hospital's staff responsibilities with this equipment. Let's jump back to the Explore tab. In Explore in 3D, you will place a solo piece of equipment. Once placed, you can access any of the hotspots, which contain information on various functions of the equipment, such as how tubing works. At the bottom of the Staff tab, you may have noticed the Care Team button. This brings us to a separate panel, which will tell us about all the different types of hospital staff that are participating. Well, Dr. Newmar stop the, uh, stop the, have any the of these uh, video right now, he can. Uh, so it goes on, but again, you can, you can see how, you know, family members can be easily overwhelmed when they're faced with this. So this is a way to educate them and to help uh, get them through what's going on. And we're developing some other adjuncts uh, for this. But it's another great story of a collaboration of nurses, clinicians, computer scientists, and entrepreneurs in the area uh, to bring this out uh, to market. Next slide. So uh, that's that my presentation, but I, we just wanted to tell you the story about uh, how we're uniquely leveraging the great minds that exist across the University of Michigan. There's, there's so many. And again, this is uh, what I consider sort of team science at its best. It's built on a novel platform, recognizing need and getting people uh, much smarter than an individual uh, to come together and to accelerate those aha moments and ideas through unique sources of funding, but also uh, getting investment and interest from the entrepreneurial uh, community uh, that exists locally, statewide and nationally uh, to help bring these important discoveries uh, to market. Because if they just exist in the lab, uh, they're not gonna do us uh, any good. And uh, again, we've given you some great examples of, of sort of, you know, we're 30 years into emergency medicine, Dr. Newmar and I, and uh, we're desperate for new solutions. So this is how we're trying to bring the Michigan difference to bear. Thanks. Awesome. Well, seeing that we, we don't have any questions at this time, um, I just want to.
provide a, a huge thank you and virtual round of applause to our special guests, uh, Dr. Newmar and Dr. Ward, uh, for sharing that great information today. Very, very informative and innovative. And if you'd like to review anything that they said, you will receive an email with the link to a recording of, of this event. Um, also, I want to thank our Washtenaw Econ Economic Club sponsors again and our Spark, uh, Washtenaw County Government, ITC Holdings, uh, the Highland Group, Bank of Ann Arbor, Level One Bank, and Washtenaw Community College because we couldn't provide these top-notch informative presentations like this without your support. We ask that you please mark your calendars for the next Washtenaw Economic Club presentation on Thursday, September 16th. You will not want to miss it. It will feature David Barfield, who's the Group Development Officer at the Impelum Group and former CEO of Bartech Group. He'll use his first-person experience to present to you the evolution of a local business to a global enterprise. Last but not least, you will be prompted to take a short survey about today's presentation momentarily. Uh, your feedback is important to us and informs us about future programming, really as we start to set the stage to plan for in-person events again. So please take a moment to complete it. Uh, we thank you and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.